So find, find with me page 18, 1803, page 1803, 1803. Find that Bible, find that Bible and find that page. And when you get to that page, there is a reading there that I want uh, each of us to take a look at. Page 1803 in the Devotional Bible. Okay, I trust everyone is there. No? Okay, I'll, I'll wait, we'll wait. We'll wait, no problem. We'll wait. Page 1803 in the Devotional Bible. Okay, how are we doing now, saints? Amen, amen, amen. Every saint should have a copy of the scripture in your hands. Yeah. Every saint should have a copy of the scriptures in your hand. And we're reading together this wonderful, wonderful expression. All right. So gentlemen, you have a copy? Our ushers? Got a copy? Get a copy. Get, get a copy of the scripture in your hand. This Bible, this Bible, yes. Turn to page 101803. Every saint should have a copy. Share it with uh, someone if you don't have one. Okay, I'm trusting everyone is there. I'm trusting everyone is there. Is that, case? Is that the case? You'll find, you'll find this title, His Presence. Do you see that? Yeah. Very good. Let's, I, I'm, I'm going to read aloud, but I want you to follow with me. I think it's pertinent to where we are when we come to worship. This is very instructive. It helps us to understand again uh, the significance of what we do by way of corporate worship. His presence. Wait patiently with me. Now this is, this is as it were, if God were speaking. So the writer of this is taking, taking a liberty to speak on behalf of God. And his writing is consistent with what the Spirit of God would be saying in Scripture. In fact, David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. Remember that in the scripture? Listen to this. Wait patiently with me while I bless you. Revelation 1, 3 says, Blessed is he who reads and they who hear and they who do the prophecies of this book. God would say to us, wait patiently with me while I bless you. Don't rush into my presence with time consciousness gnawing at your mind. The Spirit of God can pick up those nuances of our thoughts that are pulled away from him. So if you're thinking about what's happening after church, God knows it, and what he wants you to do is dismiss it, put it aside, forget about what appointment, what place, what person, what thing you're going to be doing. It is insignificant in the presence of God. And so he would say to us, don't rush into my presence with a time consciousness gnawing at your mind. I dwell in timelessness. I am, I was, I will always be. Revelation 
1, 4 says grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. For you, time is a protection. You're a frail creature who can handle only 24-hour segments of life. What a reminder. What a reminder. Jesus said, don't, don't allow tomorrow's worries infect your life today. Sufficient today. You've got enough to deal with right now. Is that true? He said sufficient today are the worries. So leave tomorrow alone. Let him handle your tomorrow. And he says, for your protection, deal with the 24-hour segment that's before you. Time can also be a tyrant ticking away relentlessly in your mind. Learn to master time or it will master you. Though you are a time-bound creature, seek to meet me in timelessness. I would suggest to you, beloved, that when we entered this room, we entered into a place of timelessness. We didn't put God on a clock. We didn't stop. We didn't start the, the, uh, the watch, the time, the, the stopper, or the stopwatch. We didn't stop. We didn't start it. So we're not rushing him. To do, okay, God, do what you're going to do. Come on. We're not rushing him. And as you focus on my presence, this, this uh, statement says, the demands of time and task will diminish. I will bless you and keep you, making my face shine upon you graciously, giving you peace. What a wonderful encouragement coming from the devotional Bible, and we thank God for the gift that was given to this church by way of the devotional Bible to help us meditate and to pull us into this place of God's presence. And God, save us, forgive us for reducing these moments to anything but the worship of Jesus Christ. Forgive us for our frailty in our thinking our lack of concentration, the ease with which we are distracted. It doesn't take much for our frail minds, Lord, to be pulled away. Forgive us for that. Forgive us for our self-importance, how we perceive ourselves. Praying that even now as we are confronted by the living word and the authority with which it speaks to us, I pray that you will call every soul under the sound of my voice. Call each of us into question. Call each of us into submission. Call each of us into repentance. And we pray that you will speak through your word to every soul. Quiet our hearts, our spirits in your presence. The writer said the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Help us, Father, to hush our thoughts, our words, our anxieties. Calm us. And we treasure, help us to treasure these moments, these uh, stilled moments where time stops for us now. The tick of the clock is not imposing its pressure on us. 
but I pray that you will take um, every liberty in your spirit to speak, to manifest your presence. And we give you praise even now in the, and, and through the precious name of the Lord Jesus. And it is with thanksgiving we pray as always. Hmm. I trust each of you have a copy of the the notes. <clears throat> if, if you don't, if you don't have a copy of, of these notes, we ran off a bunch of them this morning. So if you don't have a copy, would you just slip your hand up? The ushers are, are they have they have those. So some some of the gentlemen up front and ladies up front don't have copies. Uh, Brother Waters, right up here, right up front. Yeah, do do grab a copy. I I've been um, trying to get to Revelation chapter two. I've been trying to get there. I don't I can't I've forgotten now what what I, I think. We've been in the book of Revelation now about two months or more, I believe. It was my plan, and I emphasize my plan. It was my plan to be in the, the uh, book of Revelation chapter 2 by now. I had, I had intended on talking about, preaching about those seven churches of Asia Minor. Those were my plans. And over the past few weeks, each time I've attempted um, to move on, I have felt the press of the Spirit of God, <laughs> almost like, like the commercial where the, the elephant sits on the woman's chest. <laughs> I have felt the press of the Spirit of God saying, not yet, not yet, not yet. Amen. And, and, and so in, in my thinking and in my praying, I, I know I, I've shared a lot. There's a lot. And what I've tried to do is condense the past few weeks in an outline form. And that's what you have in front of you. Things that we've talked about. In, and so this is somewhat of a summation, a summary, as we're moving to chapter two. We have to get to chapter two. And thank you for that. <laughs> I so appreciate that. Amen. Because you're echoing, you're echoing the the the, uh, the spirit of God. He's, he's telling me, take take your time. What's the rush? Where are you going? But with with that in mind, um, real real, um, I just want you um, to be aware of what we're looking at when we're talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so what you have in front of you, again, is an outline of, of my studies in, these, in, in the book of, of Revelation. And so for those who are on Wednesday night, who come on Wednesday night to our, our Bible study on Wednesday night, we're studying the entire book of Revelation. You'll add this, if you will, to your, it'll be a supplement to your notes. You have a completed a set of notes for the book of Revelation. This you will add to your notes, and we'll be adding more, but at the same time, for the Sunday, those of you who are coming on Sunday, this is a summation, again, of things we've shared, particularly in chapter 1. In chapter 1. And basically, the book, the letter, the scroll that was written by John was written to explain the coming of Jesus Christ. That is the central theme of the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the coming of Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 1 verse 8 in I'm sorry verse 7 in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, John writes this, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, 
and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so. Amen. Amen. This idea of the coming of Christ, again, is the central theme of this precious book called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. He is coming. In chapter one, starting in verse one, what we have, as as noted there in the outline, we have in verses one through three, we have what we what we see is a collaboration relative to the book of Revelation. There's a collaboration between God the Father, God the Son, angels, John, and the seven churches. It starts with God the Father, as as does everything in creation. Everything starts with God the Father. That is, God the Father is the authority, the ultimate authority in the Godhead. The Son of God submits to the authority of the Father, yet he is equal in essence. The Son is God, equal in essence. But in terms of his relationship to the Father, he is submissive. I would suggest to you that a wonderful illustration of this is in the marriage relationship. That's why God created marriage. He created marriage to be a a representative, a representation of the relationship that exists within the Godhead. That though the man was created first, and hence he has authority, the woman was created from the man. They are of the same essence. They are of the same substance. But the woman was created to be in subjection to the man, to the man's authority. Why? Why? Because it pictures the submission of the son to the father. So the idea is 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 that when when we're thinking about marriage, the idea is that marriage points to the Godhead. And women should be the wife should be in subjection lovingly. uh, Supportively, respectfully, with honor should be in subjection to her husband. Why? Because the son is in subjection to the father with respect and with honor. In fact, Jesus said when he was in the earth, he said, I I won't do anything. I do nothing of my own, but what the father has sent me to do. So yeah, there, there is this collaboration within the Godhead, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, Look at the text there. It says the revelation which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. He sent and signified it with symbols by his angel to his servant, John. Look at the hands that this the book of Revelation trans uh, 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 went through. It started with the father to the son. To the angels, to the servant. And finally, it gets to the church. Look at verse four, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So there was collaboration in the writing of this this wonderful letter. And then what we're looking at in verse seven, that there is the commencement of what? Of his coming. And that's what John announces. He is coming. But with the commencement of his coming, you, you and I need to know. And I'm just trying to summarize again things we've talked about. Before we get to chapter 2, with his commencement, when Christ proclaims, when John proclaims, behold, he is coming, you and I have to know this. We have to be aware of this, that when he enters the world, when he comes back to the world, that he will converge, there will be a convergence of his presence of his power and of his purpose in the world. You and I have to know this, that they will not, the world will not roll out the red carpet. 
for Jesus Christ in his return. In fact, they're in denial. They're in denial. One, some are in denial that he ever existed, let alone that he's coming back. There will be a convergence of worldviews. That this is so major. This is so major when you're reading scripture, when particularly the book of Revelation. God gets right up in our face. As, as essentially grabbing us by our collective collar and saying, this is not the way you run a world. And I'm coming back to fix it. His return is bringing about a sense of convergence of worldviews. That is how we view reality. The world looks at reality one way. And clearly, when you read scripture, when you read Revelation, God views reality a different way. In fact, his reality, he's going to impose it on the world. He will not ask for permission. He will not seek a consensus. He doesn't have to. <laughs> he's the creator. This, this is a reminder, I think, going for us. Should be a reminder to us, especially as believers. Sometimes, I think inadvertently, I'm, I'm just telling you sometimes what happens in my mind. Sometimes in my mind, almost I, I feel at times that I'm, I'm doing God a favor. Forgive me, God. And I think I'm talking on your behalf as well. Sometimes we think as if we're doing God a favor. I'm, I'm, I, think, I think I'm going to, I, I, I think I'll do this this time for, for you, God. Um, and sometimes, um, in, you know, whether it be, whether it be uh, um, yeah, prayer, sometimes we think, you know what, God, I think I'll pray tonight. Or, or maybe I'll do you a favor. I'll, I'll read the scripture, and maybe I'll memorize a verse. Jesus wept. Now, good. Is that? We we think often, often. Now, now maybe 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 the, the the words don't come to mind, but but certainly our actions seem to indicate we we perform and we act and we behave often as if we think we're doing God a favor. Beloved, you don't don't look if if you if if you if you're trying to. Do God a favor. Forget it. Keep it. You need to do this because you just ought to do it. It's the right thing to do. Why? Because God is imposing his will on a fallen world. And what he wants to do, what he wants to do is correct the the course in which we've taken there is, there is what, what I've described in the notes, a Christ-centered biblical worldview that God wants every believer to embrace. In fact, that's what I believe John is saying in what Jesus is declaring in Revelation 1.8. When Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. Ultimately, one of the things that he's declaring there is, is a worldview. That is a sense of what reality really means. What does it really mean to be human? How should I understand myself? See, a worldview, a worldview is, is, is a lens it's glasses through which you see and understand the world. If I take off my, my glasses, since I, I've um, been a diabetic, my, um, my, my ability to, 
to see clearly. I can see faces back there without my glasses. I can see faces now. I know it's uh, Sister Bonnie, Sister Betty, and and uh, uh, is that is that Ian? Oh wow, man! Bless you, brother. I, I, I can see I, I can do that. But but you know what? I can't see the finer distinctions of, of their face. I, I see images without glasses. I can do that. So I'm panning, I'm panning the audience and I can see just just the the outer um, silhouette almost. And but but you know what? My my perception changes when I put these bifocals on. Oh, don't laugh at me. Keep, keep on living. You're going to wear some bifocals, too. They, they used to call them, what, Coke bottles, you know. That's all right. I, I'll wear them. It helps me to see. But, but, but check this out. Check this out. See, what God wants every believer to do is put your glasses on. Stop trying to walk around in this world with your glasses off. You're going to be running into stuff. At night when I'm driving... The, 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 the distance, I, I can't gauge the distance real well. So, and, and that's since coming down with, with uh, diabetes. So at, at night, I realize I need, to, I need to drive, I need to change my behavior because of my vision. And, and, and all of that because of what? The lens, the lens the, through which I'm looking at helps me to understand my reality better. And I'm saying to you, beloved, that uh, what Revelation does for us declares unequivocally a worldview, a way, the right way, the proper way to look at the world. Yes, and, and so worldview, worldview has, has, been, has been totally, totally ripped away from the, the moorings of, of a God-centered world. Back, back in the 17th, 18th century, there was this, this uh, worldview that was promoted. And it, was, it was during a time what was called the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, in fact, was that age in which Darwin, it, Darwin um, came up with his evolutionary theory. Because in, in the Enlightenment, basically, the worldview is this, is, is that man is, is smart enough to figure this out, God. We don't need you. We can reason. We've got minds. We can think. We don't need a God. We don't need a cosmic savior to come down here and save us. That kind of thinking happened in, in, during the Enlightenment. That's called, that, that was called, by the way, a, 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 modern, a modern thought. Being modern. And basically that modern thought suggested that there is no such thing as the supernatural. There's no such thing as, 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 as miracles. There's no such thing as, as, as needing a savior. There's no such thing as sin. That, that's the, the modern thinking that invaded this world. Moved, and what did they do? They moved away from a God-centered thought. Culturally and socially, it infected the entire culture. Amen. The, the West, European thinking, um, American thought. And it's reflected, it, it's even in our, our schools. A godless, a godless philosophy, a godless f- curriculum that teaches, that basically teaches that by way of reason, man can figure this out. We, we don't need, we don't need supernatural inventing, in, in intervention of any sort. And all you need to do, beloved, is just look. Just look. Really? Seriously? We, we can do this on our own? And this, this modern, this new movement now is even to, to reject any truth. To re, what, what they've done is just reject transcendent truth. That, that truth doesn't come from out there. Doesn't come, doesn't come from a book. You don't need a Bible. They've rejected the transcendent truth of the word of God. And Revelation is about God reestablishing Christ-centered biblical thinking. 
uh, now, now, now the movement is is not just not just that we reject transcendent thought as if we need truth, but now the modern thinking is everybody has their own truth. See, when, when you when when you when you reject the truth, everybody can create their own truth. It goes right back to the book of Judges. You ever read in the book of Judges? The Bible says that every man did what was right in his own mind. Amen. That, ex- that expresses pretty much what, what's happening in, in, our, in our world today. Yes, sir. Revelation, Revelation, the book of Revelation, it's, it's, it's this idea that God is, is bringing a convergence, a collision. We're on a collision course with a Christ-centered biblical worldview. And guess who's going to win? Yes, sir. Don't, don't, don't even think about the answer to that. <laughs> don't, don't pause. Just keep going. You know God's going to win this thing. Amen. And if you, if you don't know it, see, now that's why, that's why it, it's, it's to your advantage yes, to read sir. the scripture. Yes, sir. Because when I get to chapter 22, guess what I see? We win. That's what I see. He, he's without a doubt, without a doubt. Old men will have their say. They're having their say. And, and all it does is point to the patience and the mercy of God. We're living in an age of grace. God is God is being gracious. He, he's being a, 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 a divine gentleman. He, he's being patient with me. Oh, and you know, you know, and I'm telling you, beloved, please pray for me. And I am so serious about this thing. I'm, I'm pray for me. Be- because when, 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 when these when these converging ideas come into my in, into my orbit, yes, sir. I, I get this what I call holy indignation. I, I just get angry and I'm ready. I'm ready at, at any point to, to call down the imprecatory fire of God. Destroy them, Lord. Send them to hell where they belong. I said, pray for me. Because the Savior says, not yet. Amen. But I, I, I'm praying. And, and in fact, some of, the, some of the saints who died under the altar, they're crying, how long, O oh Lord? Yes. How long are you going to put up with this stuff? That's right. That's right. David prayed this imprecatory. Imprecatory means he's calling down judgment. Amen. He prayed this imprecatory prayer. He said, Lord, how, oh God, how I hate them with perfect hatred. What is perfect hatred? Yes. The dude is angry. Elijah, Elijah called fire down. Some of the disciples, when, when, when they heard about how they were talking about Jesus, some of the disciples said, Lord, Lord, you want us to call fire down from? And Jesus said to, to his disciples, you don't know what spirit you have. All, all, I'm, saying, all I'm saying is that we're, we're confronted by, by this, this man-centered worldview. The, the secularization of our thing. Secular means people oriented. See, we're, we're no longer God oriented. We're secular. Come on. We're thinking, how does this affect man? You know what? We, we can fix this. And if you watch, you know what? Just, just watch the programming on television. Just watch it. Just watch. You, you will not hear. If you do, it's going to be rare. It's going to be rare where you'll find programming that runs into a problem and then they appeal to God to fix it. Amen. You don't see that? No you see, you see um, the, 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 the people, the men riding in on white horses and, and men fixing it themselves. Yes, we don't need God. Amen. And, and here, here we... we um, we, we sense the mood. It's the mood of our world. And this mood can infect the church. And, and, and in fact, let me, let me just speed up one moment. That's why, that's why he, he sends this letter to the seven churches. 
because the seven churches are living in the in the air and in the mood of the culture. And sometimes the culture presses in on the church. They start thinking like the world, losing a sense of orientation to a Christ centered biblical worldview. And, and beloved, those seven churches existed 2000 years ago and and. Today, the same thing exists, perhaps even more so that we have biblical, we have people who say that they're Christians and, and they're operating their lives not based on the book, but based on secular thinking. What, is, what does it look like to be a biblically Christ-centered believer? It looks like it would look like, it ought to look like, that you and I as believers are habitually in con- consultation with God in the book. See, the book becomes our reference for the thought, for God's thoughts. It becomes the measure of our own thoughts. Because when I read God's word, his word checks my thinking. His word says, no. Hallelujah. Fix it, David. But you see, when, when people who don't consult the word of God yes, and sir. say that they're Christians, you have every right to wonder, am I really a genuine, authentic believer? You can't, you can't, you can't be an authentic believer and run your life by a secular perception of your reality. A few years ago, um, my sons and I, we, we took a, um, a fishing trip. We, we went out, um, out uh, Ocean City. And we, we uh, got on a boat. And the, the uh, chartered boat, he took us 25 miles out. And... The further we went out, the smaller the horizon looked. The buildings, miles went by, miles went by, and those buildings became smaller and smaller. Until finally, 25 miles offshore, we couldn't see land at all. All we could see was the horizon. In the horizon was water, where the water met the sky. Our world, our world has pushed away from the shoreline, out in the ocean of time. After this, you know what they've done? They have taken the compass that gives them a sense of orientation in terms of where they are, and they've thrown it overboard. They, they become their own compass. And they declare essentially that Wherever I want to be, I, I'll be there when I get there, wherever that is. And it, 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 it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just there, as the scripture would call it, they're lost. Amen. See, lostness, lostness rejects the authority of God's word. Amen. And you, you and I can, can be, we can call ourselves believers. But, uh, beloved, the ultimate test is what do you do with the book? Amen. That's, that's the test. And, in fact, that's the test by which God will measure you by. And there are a lot of folk, a lot of folk in churches all over this country and perhaps even all over the world who declare their allegiance to Jesus Christ. And care a whit about what he said. Care nothing about what he said. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my word. See, the love of God is ultimately and genuinely measured by what you and I do with the book. 
this 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 convergence and this change is going to create a, a huge crisis. That's your your fourth point there in your outline. Yeah. This world this world just is not going to roll over and and uh, roll out the red carpet for Jesus Christ. Amen. And in fact, um, the world won't, and and individuals don't. I, I, you know, preachers and um, teachers, we all, I, I mean, we, we, we share truth with, with folk yeah. and, and we do it, we, we do it um, pretty regularly. And, and um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, this, this was, this was just reiterated in, in our experience when, when Mount Airy, this predominantly white church came down here to Baltimore with us. And on a Sunday afternoon, they spent a couple of hours with us in the African-American community called Pimlico. That was amazing. It was just an amazing, it was just a marvelous, a marvelous experience to, to, to be with um, brethren of, of another hue. But we're one in Jesus. And, and, and so the diversity doesn't get in the way. It, 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 it just didn't get it. It doesn't. And, and the reason why is because we, we have this this uh, this love for Jesus Christ yes, sir. that that tears down walls, Amen. opinions and yes, and thoughts and added. It, it, it just it just vanquishes those 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 issues that divide. Yes. We had a wonderful time back there. And, and yet when we're walking back there sharing the truth um, and, and, and we, we tried to be as unoffensive as possible in, in, in appealing to people, in, in wanting to engage them with the gospel. And so we asked the question that we thought everyone would agree to. What can we pray for you about? And, and sure enough, there were people who pushed back on that and said, I'm good, I don't need prayer. What, 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 what is that? What is that? Ultimately, it comes, it comes from, um, again, this, this man-centered um, thinking and and they had the nerve to say, "I'm good." Yeah. Well, he's good because he doesn't have his Christ-centered biblical worldview glasses on. Right. See, when 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 you're when you're not when you're not looking through the right lens, you're good. Yeah. At least you think you are. Yes, sir. But but your 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 perception is hugely distorted if you're not looking at yourself through the lens of Scripture. There's no way you're good. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This this is is a huge revelation of, of, of Jesus Christ is a huge crisis that's on the horizon for our for our for our world. And it's a crisis of change and control. Who, who really, who is really going to be in control? Who really is, is, has the right? And, and so this, this crisis of change, when, when you're reading in Revelation, you'll see chapters 6 through 18. You'll see the tribulation period. Seven seal judgments, seven trumpets, seven bowl judgments. And what you see in those judgments, again, is is crisis. God is bringing, deliberately bringing upon the world a systematic destruction of this world. Ecologically, he's, he's tearing down those things that the world ultimately has been trusting in. The ecology, earthquakes. Stars falling, sun turning, moon turning red, sun no longer giving its light. Yes, sir. This, this, this is God's way of, of appealing to man to bring him to a place of, of repentance. Turn, turn, turn. But man persists, man persists. God brings the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. And then finally, in Revelation 19, he does come. Yes, sir. And that return of Jesus Christ will ultimately lead to a conflict, an inevitable conflict. Amen. And that, that conflict will ensue in the place called 
um, around the Mount of Megiddo, Har-Mageddon or Armageddon, this place where, where it's a huge open plain. A field where men will mount, will attempt to mount an offensive um, attack on, on, in fact, turn with me to Revelation 19. Look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19 and verse 11. Look at this. The conflict will ensue. It's an inevitable conflict. And John says, now I saw in heaven it opened and behold, a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in his righteousness, he judges and makes war. (laughs) See, our our world has a distorted, even a distorted perception of Jesus Christ himself. They don't think he's competent enough to 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 be at war, to be warlike. But in Revelation 1, you can see him dressed up in his war uniform. Yes, sir. In Revelation 19, he's actually coming to create conflict, crisis, to yes. challenge man's right, to demonstrate his own authority over and supremacy Amen. over mankind. Yes, sir. He judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one except himself knew. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. The armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. He's creating a wine. What's the wine called? It's called the fierceness and wrath of God. Have you had a cup? Have you ever had a drink from the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God? That's what the world is awaiting. What's awaiting the world? He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He will come back. He will come back. And then condemnation in chapter 20 will ensue. And then the culmination of all things in chapters 21 through 22. This this is uh, an an incredible, an incredible uh, time in which we're living right now in the world. <coughs> and if, if you're at all, in, at all aware of, of what the scriptures are teaching, you, you probably, you should sense that there's something that's going to happen. Yes, sir. It, 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 th- there seems to be A a rumbling, an an undercurrent of of something pretty uh, dramatic that's going to take place. And and clearly, clearly it's it's in the scripture from from which we get this 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 sensitivity to to change and conflict. You know, I, I wouldn't sense anything if I didn't read scripture. It's the scripture that gives me that. And, and so some might say, some might push back and say, well, stop reading scripture, man. I'm getting all uptight about it. This is just normal. This has always happened. This is always going to happen. It's just going to stay like this forever and ever. It always has been, always will be. See, the, the problem isn't me reading. The problem is the world not, not reading. See, because Jesus said, don't let that hour catch you like a thief. And that you and I need to clothe our minds with a sense of expectation that if if he takes another 5, 10, 15, 20 years or even 30, if he takes that, so be it. But you and I as believers should be expecting him today. This could be the day. And there is absolutely no reason why he need not come. Nothing keeps him from breaking that eastern sky, splitting the sky, and calling us into the air. There's nothing that keeps him. 
So you ought to be ready. You ought to be thinking that this could be the day. Amen. How dare, how dare you walk around. And in fact, Jesus said when you, when you walk around without being cognizant of that, you're walking around unclothed. Yes, sir. Put your clothes on. Put your spiritual clothing on. Yeah. Put your mind, get your mind renewed. Yeah. Yes, sir. Jesus is coming. Yeah. And today, holla, he, it would be, it would be marvelous. Yes, I can't think, I can't think of anything more exciting. In the moment when the trump of God will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, we who are alive will be caught up to meet him. I can't think of anything more exciting. I, I, I want to see him. To look upon his face. Cares all past. My home is not here. This this is just a stopover. I'm preparing to go home. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing. Nothing has that kind of value but Jesus. And the only reason that is so for me is because I've got my glasses on. We rejoice. We rejoice. In the coming of Jesus Christ. Father, we look around the world.